Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, I just had somebody comment on the videos and comment on the audio and so on and so forth. And he does preface his comments by saying, don't block him, don't ban him. He's going to be blocked. In the process of getting ready to block him, I checked and I noticed that the people whom, 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 whom are part of the student loan program, we were trying to let them know that we will have their documents out to them by Thursday. However, this is me trying to email them for the last two days. See? It keeps bouncing back. They're talking about aliases and all of that stupid stuff, but it hasn't happened with any other articles, any other accounts. It's only happening with this one. Imagine that. Amazing. So, um, we will get the information to you guys. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I got to go and finish up some things. It is Monday. I do want to say something. There is an individual whom I was doing a consult with, and apparently he decided he was going to cause a whole lot of problems, interrupt me while I was doing the consult, uh, dictate how it was going to be done and what was going to be said and what he was and was not going to do and that he wasn't going to listen. And so I had to do his consult in absentia, which basically means I did the consult without him. And I sent it to him because I have to keep my word. I promised the individual a consult. I got the information on what he wanted to discuss. And I did miss one point. So he did email it and I saw it and I answered it. And I told him that was it. I ain't got time. He has called me almost 40 times since then from at least six different phone numbers, including trying to call me privately. <sighs> I'm only gonna allow it a little bit longer. Yeah, yeah, I'm patient, I'm patient. But I'm only gonna allow it a little bit longer and then I will file a restraining order against him. I have no problem doing that. Look, the situation is in our lives, we do things that we think is necessary. Other people say, hey, you're infringing. You need to stop. We don't listen. And we keep going and we keep going till we cause our own selves our own problems. Well, sometimes we cause ourselves enough problems and we don't even realize that we're the one who are the problem. I don't know. Take it for what it's worth. Oh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, those videos that you saw just being put up, those were on the Redress channel. I took those videos from the Redress channel. Got to mark them as red. This is spam mail. Um, took them from the Redress channel and I brought them to the current channel. Because that's what I do. And I brought them to the current channel, but Google took almost 24 hours for me to upload those videos. This is what Google is doing, people. Uh, well, Google's not actually doing it. Let me stop saying Google. Okay, Skynet is doing it. There's their algorithm that they have put in place. So, um, we'll get the documents and the stuff to you guys. You know what? There is something I need to talk to y'all about, and I don't have the document. I closed it. I closed the document, y'all. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the laws you did not know exist, and it says if a party wants to and desires to rescind the contract on the grounds of a mistake or fraud, he must do it upon discovery of the mistake or fraud. So well, I did was not look. This was not intentional. I was actually gonna pull up a document where I had already found a different case talking about the same thing, and not that particular document. And Lord have mercy, that was showing right in front of me. I don't believe in coincidences. So I told you guys I was creating these templates for our peoples, those who December that we're gonna be helping who are already in court. This document is for those people who are incarcerated uh, for one crime or another. Ladies and gentlemen, petition for vacator of judgment for denial of due process and facilitating an unlawful process under the guise of color of law. Please take judicial notice of the following facts and conclusions of law as evidenced by the supreme law of the land, the United States of America Constitution, the state constitution, we're going to have to capitalize state. We can't have no state be lowercase. All right? That's Google that does that. The Northwest Ordinance, come on, we got to capitalize the ordinance because it's an ordinance. You know, you, you can't have just, just a simple ordinance. You got to have the Northwest Ordinance, the Right to Petition Act, the Magna Carta. Magna? Man, I had a... Anyway, and the Declaration of Independence. And the common law for each as they were founded. 
in Erie versus Tompkins, the Supreme Court said that there is no federal common law. Well, ladies and gentlemen, who cares? Nobody cares about a federal common law, but there is a common law for the United States. Now, how do we know there's a common law for the United States? Because that's what the people intended. Look at the Seventh Amendment. It said, any controversy over $20 shall be had at common law. At common law. Any controversy over $20 shall be had at common law. Any controversy. So, of course, there's a common law for the United States. It may not be one for the federal government. <laughs> the federal government, we don't give up if they don't have a common law. But they recognize the common law. Go ahead and type in United States Treasury Common Law Right of Offset. Just type in Common Law Right of Offset U.S. Treasury and see if the United States does not recognize common law. Shh, don't tell nobody. But that's what the Supreme Court did. They said federal common law. They put a prerequisite there. You got to unrequisite that pre, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, the Fourth Amendment declared in the Bill of Rights, it talks about the fact of nobody having a warrant issued against them without probable cause. Ladies and gentlemen, probable cause means that a person went before the judge, pay attention, produced evidence, and requested a warrant. Well, that's called a hearing. Well, they can't have a hearing without you being present, without giving you notification that you have the right to be present. That's called ex parte. Man, we having a party. Ex parte is when they meet without you meeting. That's a due process violation. They must give you notification. Okay, now I'm just showing you guys. See, the right of the people to be secured. This is a right, not a privilege. In their persons, houses, papers, and effects. Now it says, I'm not a respecter of persons, but I do realize that my position are private. My possessions, household goods, consumer goods. I gotta put my commas here, so we'll do it now. We'll, we'll put the commas here now. I, I haven't proofread it yet. Okay, got to. Household goods, consumer goods, and once they are, and it's supposed to be as they are mine. Okay, not once they're mine. These private properties cannot be regulated by the Commerce Congress, nor can the state commercial sales as, as nor can state commercial sales as they are not for commercial use and or for commercial profit and or for commercial gain. Basically what I'm saying is once it becomes my property, Congress, you can't say that it's uh, interfering with interstate commerce. My private property can interfere with interstate commerce. That's private commerce. That's not interstate commerce. That's not commerce where you get to regulate it as if it's public. These are private commerces. If I purchase something for me, that's private. It ain't public. You don't have any jurisdiction over it, homie. That's what this is saying, okay? Then it says, against unreasonable searches and seizures. It's certainly unreasonable for the court and the prosecutor and the complaining official and, the per and or the person supplying the oath and or affirmation, i.e. the witness, to hold a hearing ex parte. Isn't that unreasonable? Yeah, if, you, if you're doing something legal and you're doing the legal process, then you, by all means have me come present. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, then I also put something in here that it's going to make it a lot longer. We got a long way to go. Okay. This, no, that's the Federal Registry about that CFR. Oh, which I don't know. Those of y'all who know about the CFR, about all crimes being commercial, hoo-wee, bet you didn't know this. Used in this part and unless the context requires otherwise, it has its terms and conditions. Well, notice one term and condition carrier, a vessel, vehicle, aircraft seized under Title 49, Chapter 11, for having been used to transport and or carry and or conceal contraband firearms, contraband cigarettes, vessels, vehicles, aircraft seized under these provisions, under other provisions of applicable law, shall be considered personal property. Ladies and gentlemen, your personal property can be seized. That's what this is talking about. Your personal property can be part of a crime. Evidence. 
Go back and read it. Well, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, it's a commercial crime. Well, when the courts and or the government is engaged in commercial business, and that's a commercial crime, they waive and abandon sovereignty. See, the government is trying to get money. It's a commercial crime. They're engaging in commerce. It's called a commercial crime for a reason. Ladies and gentlemen, here is that act of 1866. So I asked the question, did the state act in a sovereign capacity or in a corporate capacity when it organized a non-judicial court for the purpose of engaging in trust, contract, or administrative agreements and or law? And did it act differently when it organized a non-judicial empowered courts as successor to the judicially empowered court? Well, we're saying when you guys set up these non-judicial power courts, to act non-judicially, did you have the authority to do so? And what capacity did you do it in? Then we talk about misversion of felony. Hey, I'm bringing this junk to y'all attention because somebody violated my rights and you must as soon as possible make it known to some judge or other person in civil or military authority under the United States who shall, uh, if you don't do it, you can be fined and imprisoned. That's what I'm doing. Then it says be it further enacted. This is, this is the Act of 1866. I informed all of you that you need to read the Act of 1866. The Act of 1866 is your friend. Let me tell you why the Act of 1866 is your friend. We got to go to number 10. And it's down at, is it right here? Number 10. Be it further enacted that upon any and all questions of law arising out of any cause under the provisions of this Act, a final appeal, not certiorari, a final appeal, not certiorari, may be taken to the Supreme Court of the United States. A final appeal, not certiorari. Okay, do me a favor. We're, gonna, we're not going past 15 minutes. Do me a favor. Hold on. Now, this is interesting because I put that quote in there upon all questions of law arising out of a cause. They say that the Supreme Court could not distinguish the difference between a case and a cause. And it says the case was brought here on error under the 10th section of the already mentioned act, the Civil Rights Act, ladies and gentlemen, of Congress, which provides that upon all questions of law arising in any cause action under this act, the final appeal may be taken to the Supreme Court of the United States. Now, that was 1871. Okay, 1871. Now, this is 2014. Writ of errors and appeals from the final decisions of said Supreme Court shall be allowed and may be taken to the Supreme Court of the United States in a manner as form blah, 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 blah. but what it doesn't speak about is this act now this is 1929 okay they codified this okay right of appeal to the Supreme Court 1928 all right now this is another one 1972 Considering whether one by agreement cannot waive his right to appeal on the grounds of public policy and holding that the parties effectively did waive their right to appeal and that such an agreement should be binding on the parties. Ladies and gentlemen, here I'm looking for this from all final judgments of the district court. There shall be a right to appeal to the Supreme Court. Why is it that you don't have a right to appeal to the Supreme Court? A writ of certiorari is not an appeal, ladies and gentlemen. A writ of certiorari is not an appeal. Now, hold on. What the federal courts have said is you don't have the right to an appeal. Do you understand? The federal courts, you can go and do that research right now, says you don't have the right to appeal. I'm looking to see if we got any cases where Section 10 is not being applied, where it has been applied, but they say, well, that doesn't fit anymore. If it don't fit, <laughs> then I'll force it. Okay, shall have the right to appeal. The appeal shall be upon record made regulations as may be provided by law. No, that's not what it says. In equity cases, the appeal may be on question of both law and fact. And in cases of law, the appeal shall be on the question of law alone. See, this is what was considered by the court, but there is no law that says that. However, pay attention. This is coming from a Utah court. Oops. So again, you guys got these cases. You have to bring up the 1866 Act. That's how you appeal it. That's how you get junk overturned. Take it from somebody who's got his junk overturned. 
Now, did I bring up the Civil Rights Act of 1866? No, but I brought up the provisions of the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And the right to appeal? Man, I always talk about it's a right. They shall be, there shall be a right to appeal to the Supreme Court. Now, even in all final judgments of the district court, there is a right to appeal. So, ladies and gentlemen, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 is your friend. Now, with that being said, hold on. I said 15 minutes, I apologize. We got to go a little bit further because there is an issue with uh, what that, that Lincoln character. Y'all remember Lincoln? Well, hold on. Let's, let's talk about him for a second. Where are we at? Where are we at? Sorry, I got to find it real quick. Because it talked about that war they got involved in. No, it's up here. I went too far. And that's because I just reformatted this. And now I need to, it, it deals with Lincoln declaring martial law. Y'all remember that when he declared martial law? Yeah, that's what this deals with. Now my computer frozen for just a second. Give me a second, I'll get the mark. That's because I copied and pasted and put it in the middle. Pay attention. During the Civil War, President Lincoln, 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 Abraham declared a martial law in the Union and authorized U.S. military commanders to arrest, detain, and try anyone. Ladies and gentlemen, the court flags are, got the little gold trim. That's a military flag. We're in the martial law. They've never declared the martial law over. Just like the Vietnam War and the Korean War. A cessation of hostilities, but never declared the martial law over. We're still in a state of civil war. Do you guys not get that? We still have discord among the, pay attention, races of people, nationalities, which is what a civil war is. So the civil war has never been removed. Okay? Now it says he appealed to the federal court for a writ of habeas corpus, which is what Lincoln tried to submit to Sabine. He said, you ain't getting yourself no habeas corpus. I declared martial law. I declare war. Okay? So y'all just needs to pay some attention to what's going on here. And so you have to properly challenge this junk. Because if you don't, you're going to be stuck. So I'm working on this, working on the other documents, because that's what I do. Um, I'm going to give you guys every ounce that I can until I can't operate no more. And then I'm going to blame all of y'all for it, okay? Because that's what I do. All right, got to go. Take care. Arriva, dirt.